What is it like for you to compose? I mean, is it something that you do regularly? In a way, I think it's totally necessary for me to write music, and it has always been since I was a kid. I've always been into creating ideas and, and music. So it's something I always do, but not, not all the time, of course, because yeah. sometimes I'm touring more. than I, I never write really when I'm touring, except I might uh, collect ideas while I'm, I'm on tour. But I don't like sit and write in the hotel room yeah. <laughs> at all. But when I come home, I do it a lot. Mm. So it's there's so many different ways of composing. Sure. Um, some of it I'll be doing here in the music house, maybe by the piano, or it might just be ideas I get. I might be doing it with the drums. I might take a walk in the forest and have ideas growing in my head that I go home and write down. So among the trees? Like, for example... Actually, among the trees, I had made the tune before the words, though. But the ah, words, okay. I made it out, outside, definitely taking a walk. <laughs> yeah, nice. Some of your tunes uh, have a very pianistic approach, I feel. And it, it, should, it comes from you, you, know, you coming up as a, as a pianist first, right? Yeah, my whole childhood I played. Well, I had like two separate things going on. There was the classical piano I took classical piano lessons and played a lot of classical music actually my whole childhood until I, I didn't start playing percussion before I was 19. Ah. Actually. Yeah. But then yeah. on the side I had like this mysterious uh, world of mine where I would make all these little poems or tunes or it might be stories or drawings or choreographies whatever. Yeah all kinds of little creations. And that like was very separate from the classical piano studying. It's like two parallel worlds mm -hmm. in a way. And it's always been like that. And in a way, I think it's still like that for me. It's, I have this kind of privateness about writing music. It's a kind of secret thing that until it's ready to be played, it's sort of secret. <laughs> so you don't share it with, uh, do you sh sometimes share it with your husband? I mean, Not before I'm finished, really, no. Yeah. Unless Because you I, play I, a lot I, together, I, that's why I'm asking, you know, you play a lot together. Yeah. yeah, he's a bass player. Yeah. So, like, if I have some guitar or bass kind of questions, I might share a figure with him and say, is this hard to play? Is this natural? Or I might get inspiration also with chords. He's much more than me into jazz as a... As a a kind of, a, yeah, he, he's like grown up with playing jazz. So I might ask him, can you call the chord this? What would yeah. you call this chord? Uh, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Because I very much was into the, like classical way of understanding music. And uh, when I started playing with others, which I didn't do my whole childhood, I was playing piano for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And when I started playing with others, I realized they had all these rules that I didn't really know. And... Um, Somehow, I think I have the feeling I jumped onto when I started playing drums. It was like suddenly I could communicate with everyone using my ears and feeling the music and sensing the music through my body and through the rhythms. So I never really got into the jazzy way of thinking music. I mean, I think a lot in chords, but they're more or less homemade. And since I know the, I know the way uh, the Diane the what do you know, the diatonic system is built up and all that. Of course, I understand what's going on, but I can't like play jazz piano, for example. I never did that. And you yeah. wouldn't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still love playing piano. So I still play piano, but it's it's in my own kind of homemade way of of doing it. Yeah. How do you, how do you look for new colors? You know, you talked about um, finding those colors and then asking maybe your husband for advice how to call them, but how do you find them in the first place? What's your process there? Well, uh, as I said before, it's a, there's a lot of ways of composing for me, but if I'm doing it at the piano, it will more or less be that I have a, a kind of vision or a kind of uh, mood that I'm trying to grasp, and I'll just start playing and something will show up. Music is like that. It just yeah. comes down and shows up. And it might be totally different than what I thought I was go was looking for. But then I'll like follow whatever comes up. I'll be following 
the flow of it. So it, it comes, in a way, it comes by itself to me, and I see what shows up. Or it might just be that I'm searching for a, a kind of quality in the chords and just place my fingers and, oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. Or that sounds ugly <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> or maybe I'm looking for something wild or something beautiful and um, just search for it and see what, what happens. Yeah. And yeah. as I said, it might lead me in a totally different direction. So I'm ending up doing something different than I thought I was doing. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah, also nice. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me the story behind uh, Winter Spell? I just learned that song yes the day before yesterday. So I'm I'm very yeah. curious what the story is behind it and how you wrote it. Yeah, good question. Because that's also a while ago. But um, uh, of course, I would say in the winter time, I'm very much into writing these dreamy kinds of music. And uh, I'll be sitting down at the piano and this figure will come to me, the, the, the main figure of Winter Spell. Yeah. As I, as I said, it just somehow, it just pops out of the piano, um, grabbing this feeling of dreamy winter where everything is standing still. Maybe I'm not that active playing at the moment, but just composing. And um, once I have the figure, I'll be playing it and maybe singing along with it, mm -hmm. with the melody. And uh, sometimes the words come as the last thing. I don't remember, actually, with that one. Probably the words and the melody came at the same time. Hmm. And probably there was snow outside, since that's what the words are about. Yes. But I don't remember that exactly, to be quite honest. <laughs> what do you remember about the recording session and the whole process behind the, that beautiful record, Celestial Cycle? Um, you know, I, I studied with uh, John Taylor, so... Yeah. Uh, whenever I get to, to speak to somebody, because we let, lost him too early, really, uh, yes. whenever I speak to somebody who experienced something musical with him, I ask, you know, what was it like for you? What was it like to, because I like to collect these memories of, uh, yeah. of, of our, our guy, you know, John. So yes. I'm, I'm wondering about this record, whatever memories you'd like to share, what was it like? Maybe I have to go all the way back to my youth because I was a great fan of Azimuth, the trio with Norma Winstone yeah. and John and Kenny Wheeler. And I would listen to this very much. And I thought Norma was just the most beautiful singer that could touch me all the time. I really like voices and I really think she touches you with her voice. Mm. If You know, that type of person that that likes this uh, airy quality that she has. So I would listen a very lot to that when I was young. And uh, uh, some time after that, we had a band called Six Winds. This is around the 1980 or something. And uh, Alex Riel, who was one of the main members in, in Six Winds, he was a friend with uh, Kenny Wheeler. So we invited Wheeler to come and be a guest. So he was the first one I met. <laughs> of course, I had heard them also playing live in the old one March here in Copenhagen. Uh, but I hadn't met any of them. So Kenny was the first. And we played some of his tunes and a lot of my tunes, which we did in Six Winds. Um, that was the first thing. So then in 2008, now I am jumping far ahead. I, I guess I always wanted to work with Norma. But... I hadn't asked her yet. So uh, then I was artist in residence in Molde uh, Jazz Festival in Norway in 2008. And I heard that um, Tor Brunbos, a Norwegian sax player, had actually asked John Taylor to be a guest there. And I was like, oh, I have to play with this guy. <laughs> um, so I asked him and he, of course, he was there anyway. So he also wanted to play with me. And I asked him, to play on the, we were going to do a midnight concert in the cathedral in Malde. This is what I invited him to do. That's how Celestial Circle started, to do this midnight concert. And I asked him to play on the church organ also, because I had heard him oh. play organ on some records. So he did that, some of the tunes, and he had to walk all the way down to 
while I was doing some solo stuff and he would walk down and play the grand piano also. And uh, this was a larger version of Celestial Circle. We also had a sax player, Hans Ulrich, in the group. We also had a Norwegian singer-dancer to do some dancing and singing. And um, Anna Jomi was the bass player in this yeah. group. And Josephine Kronholm. Um, and of course, this was so nice that I wanted to continue working with this group. And um, so for some reason, it was easier to make a smaller group. Of course, it's always easier to tour with smaller groups. So it was uh, turned into a quartet with Josefine and Anas and me and John. And we started touring. And um, Manfred from ECM uh, wanted to record with this group. So that's how the the whole thing started. <laughs> yeah. Answer your question. And uh, we wanted to work in um, in Rainbow in Oslo to record there. So that's what we did. And uh, I think I had all my instruments uh, transported by car up there. And uh, of course, when you work with Manfred, things tend to change. So it's not so much me deciding exactly what we're doing, but he would change some of the tunes around and we would improvise a whole lot more. Mm. So I'm very often focused on my compositions, which was a, a, a big part of the, of the music in Celestial Circle. And uh, Manfred likes when we also do a lot of free uh, exchanges. So that took up a lot of space also, just... Um, doing things in the moment, and um, Anas would come with some ideas, I would come with some ideas, Manfred would come with some ideas. He would also sometimes, after we had recorded, he would change some of the uh, instrumental qualities or combinations in the mm. tunes. So he would take out John in one tune and Anas in another tune, um, doing things I found rather shocking, but um, <laughs> he would like say, see, we're not missing this or that. <laughs> Okay, let's do that. <laughs> sort of, I'm, I'm the type of person that likes going with whoever I'm working with, to, like following the, the flow of whatever happens. So I'm normally rather open to things. I'm not sure I agree totally with the way the record turned out, but there's some very nice things on, on, on that mm. album. Yeah. Into Spell, I like very much. And John's tune. Oh, yeah. Stream. Beautiful. That was it your choice? Was it your choice that um, he brought it in? No, we we already played that tune. Of, of, oh, of, I see. But it was Manfred's choice to start with it. I think on on the album. Yeah, there's another record of John's where he also starts with that tune. Yeah. Maybe Manfred liked that. <laughs> yeah, he probably did. Yeah. And it's a it worked start. once. Let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> So that album starts very dreamy with first, first your eyes and then the winter spell. So it's yes. all very kind of a glassy. <laughs> yeah. Another favorite of mine is the Antelope uh, Arabesque. Yeah. I had that on my mind the, the, today the whole time. Is there a story behind that that you'd like to share? Not so much. That's another one of those where, where I'm sitting and inventing this antelope like uh, ostinato mm. and making a tune and actually those words for that came many years later that that i do remember because the words are actually about i had this group percussion paradise which i had for seven years with basically all percussion players and we were all singing also and um The tune was actually, the words for Antelope Arabesque are made after the explosion of that band, because when that band stopped, it was like a tragic, it was like a, a kind of divorce almost, because we were really close and we had a lot of fun and it was a great band. And it all like went poof, suddenly. <laughs> and uh, then those words came to me. Yeah. Focus on the direction, and, you know. Yeah. So um, I guess that's part of the story of that one. It wasn't an antelope at first, but yeah. it became this thing jumping <laughs> into the horizon <laughs> kind of quality. What do you think about keeping a band together? If you talked uh, about that, like a, a, um, a disbanding of a band being like a divorce when it's uh, that um, involved creatively and, and um, you know, 
also psychologically or whatever. Um, how, what's your take on how to lead a band and how to keep it together? And how do you, I mean, what kind of your set of ethics to, to keep people together, basically? Well, uh, again, I'm very much into following the flow of things. And I think I stick to whatever works. I wouldn't, I mean, that's the only time I experienced that, like a kind of divorce in a band. Like I, I used to have Future Song, a band I had for, Long time. well, for more than 20 years. And then it was reunited. <laughs> and now I'm actually reuniting it again this summer because we have it, an invitation to play the Copenhagen Jazz Festival. Of course, I'm saying yes, and everyone else said yes. <laughs> um, I, I like uh, holding on to things that have a good chemistry and a good feeling. And uh, I don't do anything special to keep it together because I think of the bands as families. And as long as we're enjoying each other, we stay together. What happened with Future Song was more that as people grow as musicians, they get into following their own uh, paths also. So um, all these Norwegians like Nils Peter Malvea and Ivan Ossid, for example, uh, made their own bands and had great success with that. And then when you call them, can you do this? And no, I can't make it. I have my own tour or I have a release or whatever. So in that way, it was hard to keep the band together. And the singer, uh, the original singer in, in Future Song, Aina Kimanis, who's a bit older than me, which is quite a lot of years, <laughs> she at one point got, you know, she thought it was really stressful to, cross. she lives in California, yeah. it was really stressful, stressful for her to cross the Atlantic every time to tour. It cost her a lot of energy and also singing. She felt she lost her the voice of her youth and couldn't really do, she felt she couldn't sing my songs properly. And I would say, I'll transpose them as deep as you want them. And I'd do anything to keep her because she was another voice I was totally in love with. Um, but she somehow decided it was time to stop. So she doesn't actually sing anymore at all. Mm -hmm. But I still love her. And we are still friends and write together. So um, keeping a band together, it's somehow, what does life bring to you? And uh, then I might get ideas for creating new bands, and then they stay alive as long as someone wants to hear it and, and the musicians want to be there. Hmm. So I don't have like one way of, of doing that. Sure. The, it's, it's only a, whenever I see you live or watch videos of you all also hear the records it seems like you have a very inviting very inviting way of approaching other people when you play with them just also visually i mean you you're keeping eye contact uh, um, a lot I, i've i've noticed you know uh with when i see you with makiko or something you know you guys are like this for for a lot of time you know it's it's very engaging very uh inviting and very personal I feel yeah I mean one thing that's important for me is I don't play with someone for them to fulfill my music I play with them for them to come with their energy and their contribution so it's very important for me that every musician speaks with their own voice their own new their own mood their own instrument their own language so so it's very important that everyone feels at home and really yeah. feels they're themselves. So that's that's part of the story. That if they're not at home in my music, well, either I, we have to play some different tunes or uh, do it in a different way, or or it's not the right people. But I I do uh, follow just my impulses and intuition when I choose people. Like one example is Shamania which is my, my large uh, female group. Yep. <laughs> um, where we're 11 musicians, or 10 musicians and a dancer. Um, and when I made that group, of course, I chose some of the people that were close to me, like Makiko that you mentioned, yeah. who I've worked with in many different contexts for many years. Um, and I also have two of the ones from Percussion Paradise, in the group, 
And then I have some people that I never met before I, I gathered the group because I was invited to make this group for the Copenhagen Jazz Festival, said, uh, why don't you reunite the old Primi band, which was another female large group that I had in the late 70s and up to the, yeah, to the second half of the 80s, which I loved this group. It was like a kind of experimental music theater where we could dance and sing and drum and whatever. We did a lot of crazy things. <laughs> and I loved that group. When I started touring with Miles, it was very hard to keep that group alive. Mm. So it somehow just ended in maybe uh, around 86, I think, that group stopped more or less on its own. And uh, when I was asked to reunite the group, and I said, but I can't, of course, because most of the musicians weren't that professional in that group and aren't playing music anymore. Uh, Jade Anka, the sax player, is totally active so actually she was part of the idea of telling the Copenhagen Jazz Festival to ask me to reunite Primi Band so of course she was logic you should be in the new Shamania mm. it had to have a new name because it was not the Primi Band it wasn't the same people so I got the idea to call it Shamania which is a kind of uh, a word uh, jam on the shamanistic approach, a ritual approach, and also a kind of feminine sounding word of gathering this female energy. What can we actually bring to music together? Yeah. That's not necessarily based on jazz or anything, but more based on this gathering of power of a lot of women together. I loved how broad the the, the musical spectrum of it is, you know. I yeah. really love that. That it's another thing that I like that is so uh, inviting of you to invite all of these different voices and 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 approaches but also you know sometimes when we when we make a record we tend to be have a tunnel vision about what what it should sound like or whatever with you I feel like it's the opposite <laughs> like <laughs> bring it all in let's let's do it all but in a very so, good way, you know. And, yeah, somehow I can't have enough of colors and aspects of life in my music. I like the music to, uh, what do you call that? Sometimes it's hard for me to, to think in English, but um, to embrace is, I yeah. guess I'm looking for, to embrace the whole world and all the energies and all the vibrations and all the moods we can be in. And all the colors that all the musicians can bring also. Was this so a I process, really tried... sorry for interrupting, but was this a process for you to arrive at, okay, this is this is possible, I can invite all of this into my music and can embrace all of this, or was it that way for you always? I think it was always that way for me. Um, with Shamania, the thing was that the festival asked me to do it as a Nordic group. Um, so I was like looking for who who are great musicians in the other countries, and I would ask all my musical friends to give me some inspiration, Google all these names, and just, I want her, I want her, I want yeah. her. Yeah. And then um, once asking them, of course, I'm, I was so inspired by having all this new uh, new people coming that it, it just made me go crazy writing music and making all this new music. And I think it just happened by chance that there was some really complex things showing up. And I would also pick a couple of old things from Primi Band because it was supposed to be a kind of new Primi. And look in my, I, I wrote so much music through my life. So I would be <laughs> looking in all my archives and trying to see what would fit for the band. So it's not that I think that I have to have a, a wide spectrum. It just happens like that. And um, of course, it's important also just to think what would bring out these powers? What, how, do, how do I really get the most out of this group? Yeah. So it's important to have a lot of improvisation in the band and a lot of ex exchange of, um, of the energies of us and like speaking together in the music. Yeah, I really like that. Also, the the aspect that you talked about before, like the asking all your friends about female musicians that they might know from other countries, you know, it's it's 
it's still that way that we sometimes to find the female musicians that we'd like to play with, we have to do some more detective work because they're just fewer of them out there but uh, it's so rewarding if you if you find people that you like to play with that maybe were hidden f for some reason or whatever you know and then to bring them together is just um, yeah, I, I really found it because I knew almost nobody from from that list of, of people so it was fun to check them out separately and see what what they're up to and you know you you you've shown us who you know who, who there is and and uh, um, the, I mean that's really a service also of you I really like that <laughs> yeah one could put it like that I mean normally of course one doesn't look for female musicians one looks for musicians sounds certain instruments sure. or whatever but now I had this specific uh, thing and I mean getting this female group together made me re-experience how nice it also feels because because we play so much with all the great male musicians. Mm. And of course, I've realized long ago that my favorite groups might be when it's all mixed. So you have, again, the whole world because you have the male energies, the female energies, sure. you have some masculine women and some feminine men and whatever yeah. all mixed. Uh, um, but this happens uh, certain kind of thing when when we're all women together this is something that we have in common maybe because we're kind of outsiders almost in mm -hmm. jazz scene because we're so few that we feel we feel we we have something together when when we meet it feels really nice yeah so it's not that i think a female group is better or anything it just it's just different and gives another consistency and a, maybe another focus to the sure. group without trying to divide it up because it's not that yeah. black and white. <laughs> sure. I mean I mean whenever you it's it's um you can even talk about it in broader terms. Whenever there's somebody who is an outsider or who who doesn't belong to a group, whenever that person comes into a group, it changes the vibe. You know? The chemistry. Yeah. Always if if you have one thing, um that's maybe closed or whatever. That's that's a specific vibe, and then somebody comes in, you know. And you have been in in many uh, occasions where you were the only women, but it made it made difference not only musical, but I mean, in a, this human aspect as well. It makes a difference. It does. You made me think of all the all the journalists that asks. So how is it to be a female musician? <laughs> and the most logic is to answer. How would I know? I haven't been. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really, uh, Makiko was a, was a big discovery for me because I only heard her on this record. I hadn't heard her before, so I wasn't okay. I wasn't aware of her. I really liked her sound and uh, also how adventurous she is. Yeah. Yeah, she's wonderful. Somehow I found a kind of mate with her, a soulmate. Yeah, that's how it seems. Yeah, it's also, the thing is, coming from classical piano, I'm always writing these craving piano parts, and I make all these figures that if you don't like reading music, then it's not much fun having my piano parts. So she'll eat anything I bring for her. She's very um, devoted to the music. So she'll play whatever I ask her to play, but also bring herself in and be free playing, improvising. And she won't play it if she doesn't have to play it, of course. If if it yeah. says she can open it up, she'll do that. But she also eats my written music, <laughs> which is very important for me to have someone, because I've also played with piano players that that were frustrated with all these written parts in, in weird rhythms and stuff. And... Uh, would do whatever they could to not play those parts, mm. which could also be fine. But with, with Makiko, it has this good balance mm -hmm. that she's very uh, contributing with suggestions, with improvising, but also playing what needs to be played to lock the music in. Yeah, <laughs> and present this tune, obviously, because what you're, what you're finding there with these figures really, really sets the vibe for most of these songs. You know, if you take that away, you take away a lot of the song yeah. You know? yeah 
So I play in her groups. She plays in my groups. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I saw a, a beautiful trio video of you and, and Klaus and, um, and Makiko live somewhere. I, I don't remember where. And also, also I saw you guys playing with, uh, with Norma. Yes. And that was, that was uh, special. I really liked that. I really liked that combination. Yeah. Can you talk about that project? Yes. Now I'm trying to think, how did I even get the nerve to call her up the first time? I talked to her the day before yesterday, asking her about you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she I, said, I, uh, you guys, you guys met, uh, you know, uh, on and off. And you were always, you, you said you wanted to play with her. Yeah, and then, I've always wanted to play with her. Yeah, and then you got some... Now um, I remember, because we shared a, a gig, actually, Makiko's trio, and she was working with the NDR big band. And we were playing in the NDR. We shared a concert. She was wearing this be blue, beautiful blue dress, I remember. And um, we talked a lot there, and she said, of course, she would, she would like it. And then I guess I was just waiting for the right occasion. Which, which showed up in Denmark. They have a, something called the Winter Jazz Festival. Yeah. And uh, I had worked a bit with this group with, with Jakob Buchanan and Makiko and Klaus and, and me. And uh, it, it, it seemed to be the right occasion to invite her. And it ended up we did a whole tour of six concerts, which doesn't happen that often anymore, with Norma. And it was beautiful. So I think that's what you saw. Yeah. And it was like, it was a dream for me to, to, to work with her. And I have all these old songs that I've always heard her sing. Windfall. No, no, not Windfall, but Whirlpool. You played Whirlpool. Well, clouds. This is one, an old song of mine that, that Aina also sung. And no one else has really been able to sing that song. It's very complex. Lots of chords, by the way. <laughs> um, and then Norma came in silent. So... I was probably crying when she did that because <laughs> I've always heard her sing that song. But which which did you mention? Which song I, did you I mention? I mentioned uh, Whirlpool. Whirlpool, John Taylor's yeah. Whirlpool, which uh, I had put words to that Josefina had been singing because we were touring with um, Celestial Circle, of course, where we did Whirlpool and I put these words on. And that was very hard for, for, I think, for Josefina to sing it. But Norma, of course, had it in her backbones. So it was logic to, to use that tune. Yeah. And it all fell into place. Yeah. I think, I think Bakiko thought it was hard to play John Taylor tunes, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, she loved it, but uh, that's hard work for, if you're not the composer of the piano part. <laughs> Absolutely. He's in there with you, sitting on the bench next to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, I had to play, um, I mean, I had the pleasure of playing uh, a couple of tribute concerts uh, when, when John died, so they assembled, his manager assembled a couple of bands. One of them was actually with Anders, the Omin on bass. Oh, yeah. So I had to play with his band, uh, Italian singer Diana Torto yeah. and Anders Jormin, and Julian Siegel was playing, and we were playing John's music. I, I was on the, on the piano chair for his music. So that was quite a challenge. You know? I believe. Did you play Stango? No. 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 We played that with Norma also. Oh, yeah. Another challenging tune of John's yes. that I love playing. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I like also some of these faster, fiery tunes. Yeah. I have these extremes you're talking about. Do I like having the whole spectrum? Mm -hmm. I definitely like the outer parts of the spectrum, the really beautiful, dreamy, poetic things and the wild things going. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And John actually has both, both of Absolutely. those music too. Yes, he had both of them. And everything in between also, yeah. And everything in between. <laughs> I think I'm very much on the outer limits of, of things sometimes but uh, but playing with John and Norma now it's like most of my the dreams from my youth came true playing with all the people I admired when I was young mm -hmm. was it always um, because 
I know the feeling of dreaming of playing with somebody and then you get to play with them. Was it always for you uh, as you imagined it would be? Or was it, uh, you know, you, because I'm sure you also played along with records, imagining you would be on, uh, you know, did you or did you not? You know, I never played along with records. I've no, never okay, okay. Of course, remember, I'm an older generation. So it wasn't that easy to play along in the old mm -hmm. days. I mean, I have a place where my instruments are, another place where the record player was. And, oh, okay. But I, I never did that, and I still never really like doing that unless I really have to learn some very complex music I might try once or twice playing along. But uh, it's not my way of thinking. And also you say dreaming of playing with these musicians. Like Norma, I always wanted to work with because she's a singer. But I, I'm not the type that really thought, I'm going to play with those musicians. It's somehow it just happened. I, now I'm like also talking about Miles or Jan Gabarik. I was so much into listening to them live or on records, but it wasn't like I want to play with them. Mm -hmm. But but I do have this Miles story though that when I had the old Primi band, I had a, a real dream, a sleeping dream, that I told some of the Primis about where I had dreamed I was on tour with Miles and I was somehow disappointed because it was just like being on tour, just like being on tour was, that you're living in these hotel rooms and driving and driving and driving and driving and then you're playing and then you're <laughs> traveling. Mm -hmm. And I was disappointed that it wasn't more fantastic. Mm -hmm. and then when Miles called, called me up and said, come on Wednesday, join my band. <laughs> and this girl from Primi Band said, do you remember you told me that you dreamed this? And I had forgotten mm -hmm. <laughs> that I had had that dream. And oh, I suddenly remembered, and then I went on tour for all those years. And somehow in the end, when I decided it's time to go home and create Future Song and leave Miles, it was maybe for those reasons that The touring all over and not maybe feeling totally fulfilled. Of course not because of Miles, because he was a fantastic adventure to experience mm. being in a band with. Um, but the touring and maybe being in a band where the chemistry wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. We were maybe at, in the same place at the same time. I came from a different place. So there were parts of being in the bands with all the great Americans That wasn't that fulfilling, but that gave me the ideas for what do I really want to do to music. Perfect, Now yeah. it's time to go home and create this. Of course, totally inspired by all I learned from touring the world, playing for these great, powerful audiences, mm. led by this powerful guy that could bring the best out in his musicians. So it has these two sides. Mm. Try to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. Can you maybe get into um, what you think you've learned from Miles? And what maybe also what kind of advice he gave you at times? Um, you know, when I met Miles first, this was in Denmark for when he was receiving the Sunning Music Prize. And I was a, a guest in the in Danish radio big band invited specially for this occasion where Miles was getting the prize. Mm. Um, uh, and first, of course, it was just fantastic that he came to Denmark and I was, uh, I brought all my gong stands and I was, I was like lying on the floor under my gong stand, sneaking to, to look at him. He wasn't yet, he hadn't decided to play with the music. He was just receiving the prize and listening to Pelle Mikkelborg's great work, Aura. And then later on, he decided he wanted to play in it. Yeah. Um, but then the piano player, Thomas Clausen, said to me, Miles wants to say hello to you. And I was like, ah. <laughs> wow. Down and, hello. <laughs> uh, that was it at that time. But then he liked the music and decided to come back and record it. So we were in the studio for a week, a week together. And I still didn't talk to him that much. Um, 
but we did get a chance to work together and communicate a little bit. Um, I'm telling the story of some of the history of this. Um, the next thing that happened was I, I went to Molde. Molde has a big uh, central position in in my musical life, this mm. great festival in the middle of Norway. Uh, I went with the Danish band uh, New Jungle Orchestra to play a concert. And um, at that time, I would still always get airsick from flying. And Molde has a, had, especially at that time, a very short landing uh, <laughs> thing. And um, this little plane is landing. We knew Miles was also going to play a concert. And we wanted to go. So the plane lands and I get airsick. <laughs> and we... Uh, we want to go to the concert because it's right then the concert is starting. So we rush to Malta, to the city, and oh, it's sold out. But if you're really quiet, you can sneak in in front of the audience and sit in front of the audience. So the band sneaks in and sits there. And I'm still a little weak from this flight, sitting there. And Miles, suddenly, he spots me there on the floor. Wow. He said, lifts his trumpet and says, Marilyn! Come and sit in with us. And I'm like, uh, uh, no, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm not, not feeling too well. <laughs> and um, I'm also really shy at that time, which I probably still am. But um, sitting in has not been something I did that much at that time. But, uh, okay, so they, he gives up and they play on. And then he comes back again. Marilyn, join this reggae with us. Yeah. Of course, I can't say no to Miles twice. <laughs> so, okay, I go up and sit in on Steve Thornton's percussion up there. And it's with, at the time, with um, Daryl and mm. John Schofield. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, the, the audience doesn't really know who I am at that time. This is 1985. Mm. And I sit in. And... Um, then I go home uh, after the festival, and um, I'm teaching at a course. And when I come back to Copenhagen, there are these musicians. Miles is trying to get a hold of you, and I'm like, come on, don't tease me. <laughs> but, he, but he was, and he called me up and said, um, can you be here on Wednesday? But these things, of course, I can remember very clearly yeah. because it was the day when he called. And uh, the other part of the story you probably have heard before I am born in New York, and when I was six years old, my family immigrated to Denmark, and I never went back. And in 1985, I'm 30 years old, and I've never been back to New York, where I was born. Hmm. And Miles said, be here on Wednesday. I've never had a, a you know, a transatlantic flight. flight at that time. Um, of course, I've traveled a lot around in Europe but uh, not that far, and not at all to U.S. <laughs> so that's the way I return to my birthplace. Okay. And I have to go straight. Again, I'm not that sharp on flying. Um, actually, that's when it's, uh, I stop getting airsick. I could still get airsick sometimes, but <laughs> I stop because now I need to fly all the time, so there's no way around it. Okay. Um, so I have to go straight from the plane to the rehearsal and meet all these strangers. <laughs> At that time, the band has already changed from a couple of months earlier. There's a new bass player. Uh, there's a new guitar player. There's a, yeah, Mike Stern. Mm -hmm. Mark Burke is in the band. Um, and a lot of strangers, and it's, it's really like it's going and walking into a dream. Like, and I... I look like I have all these uh, sticky hair from the flight. And, you know, straight, I haven't even got a hotel room yet. <laughs> and at some point after rehearsing for hours, he'll, he says, uh, go take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> and I come back and say, yeah, you look better now. <laughs> he probably got a shock because I'm showing up in this travel clothes. And I didn't care too much what I looked like at the time. You know? um, and after some days of rehearsal, I'm playing my first concert with him. Before that, he's already sent me out, go buy some clothes. <laughs> So I got some, something that looked a little better. And we played on the pier in New York, uh, like three days after coming to New York. So it's mm. all like a totally dream. And then we started touring the world. Wow. Can I ask you what the rehearsal process was like? If you say re you rehearsed for days, was there sheet music involved? 
no, no. was the oh, well, there, yeah. there was sheet music involved. There was a Bobby Irving was the musical director, and of course he had transcribed the the the, the hits that Miles wanted to play. But my invitation was like, you do whatever you like. You, um, Perfect. If you want to dance, you can dance. Of course, I had to dance solo because otherwise I wouldn't really know how to come up front and, uh, and, and do a solo. There was another percussion player in the band still, uh, Steve Thornton, in this first round of Miles. So we were like three drummers, nine musicians in all. So it's like a big orchestra. Mm. Finding the place wasn't that easy, mm. coming from a totally different scene where the music was always very collective and social. And suddenly there's like the boss and all these people playing their roles. It, apart from the solo, it was, it was like very set what everyone was doing, mm. except I could do whatever. I just somehow had to find my space, which I, I guess I was um, I had to search uh, to, to find my way. And didn't find it that easy, but uh, that's of course something I, I, I learned in, in the band to find a, where can you contribute with something. And my my um, feeling of it was, I was there to add some colors and like try to accent the moods of the music. And of course, um, uh, Steve was more into the Latin kind of percussion, so I would. Yeah, try to bring in the, the gongs and the bells and the mm -hmm. and the colors. And along the way, it was like the time where the samples were invented and stuff. So I guess that was during the first year where I was. Uh, Miles asked me to stay in U.S. and not like go home between the the tour rounds. And uh, I bought one of the first sample keyboards, the the Prophet Two Thousand. And started sampling sounds and learning to use those and had a, like an octopad where I could play my own homemade sounds. So that was like a part of it also. Hmm. That, getting new sounds into it and playing weird sounds <laughs> in the music. Um, and then I had this dance solo, at which when I got the sample keyboard, we got the idea to make a dance mat. So I had this mat mat, <laughs> carpet, one could say, with little triggers on it that would trigger the samples I had made, hmm. and which was really nice because I would always dance with my foot bells, and now I could dance on the mat and say like, doing, 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 <laughs> with my feet while I was playing my talking drum, which was fun, but it didn't work that well because it was like in the... Very early stages. stages. So these these triggers would get worn down on the tour. So I had to stamp really hard, which would sort of limit my dance movements because I was like, <laughs> 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 um, somehow it wasn't working that well. But it was a good idea. Hmm. Which, uh, in a way, it would be fun if I brought that idea further in my life. But at one point, at one point much later in my life, I somehow decided now there's so many musicians doing electronics and stuff. And I started to feel my, my position in music is to be organic and uh, play more acoustic sounds. I don't use the electronics that much. I have some, but I, I don't really bring them out much. Mm anymore <laughs> but I did for a long time also with with Wayne Shorter that I haven't talked much about yet but we will get into him we'll get there <laughs> and uh he actually asked me now I'm jumping into it but uh if that's okay <laughs> you can do whatever you want <laughs> sure <laughs> they actually asked me in the Wayne Shorter quintet to not bring acoustic percussion but to play only electronics Wow. And I somehow ended up being allowed to bring a little gong stand with some of my more like bell sounds and stuff, but no uh, congas, no acoustic uh, percussion things. Which I, was saw, I, I saw something from Lugano the other day. Okay. Where you played, you know, there were some other th th things there as well. Yeah, I had some of the bell sounds and, and gong sounds, and then I had my octopad yeah. with the keyboard. I also played keyboard with yes, Wayne. Yes, I, I need to talk to you about this. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> what else do I have there? I might have had a couple of cowbells. A couple of cymbals. Could I play solo on? Uh, 
kettlebells and maybe some small chimbalitos or something. Yeah. But, but not like the hand stuff. And yeah. So it was definitely a kind of limitation. I like challenges and I like limitations, but, it, but that was a hard time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> a hard time in your life. Yeah, the year with Wayne was really tough. Do you want to get into it? Yeah, I kind of tell a little about it. I mean, uh, well, it just came about in a strange way because this was after the first year with Miles. And uh, Wayne would call me up in the middle of the night. Uh, you want to hear all these <laughs> weird stories? Yes. Uh, he would call me up. He had just lost his daughter. Yeah. And I had just lost my mother, yeah. which, uh, which the story was in a way that uh, if Miles hadn't sent me home after the first year, I wouldn't have seen my mother again. But he sent me home, and I got a little time with my mother before she wow. died. I wasn't that old, and neither was she. Well, then, then Wayne would call me up, and he somehow knew that I'd lost my mother. And um, he would uh, talk, and I would say, after some times of talking on the phone, I would say, you know, it's, uh, it's three o'clock in the morning. Maybe you could call at a more decent hour. <laughs> And he said, oh, I'm just testing your velocity. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't actually really know what the velocity meant, except from the keyboard, where it had something to do with how hard you pressed. Anyway, I don't remember if he kept calling me at three in the morning. He probably did. <laughs> he invited me to come as a, uh, to record with him on the album Phantom Nav Navigator. Isn't it called that? I think, mm -hmm. yeah. And... Um, Okay, actually at the time he was going to record, I was going to Chicago to play at the festival with New Jungle Orchestra again. And it, the time was coming close and it was like I got a little impatient here because I didn't know what was happening. And uh, Wayne said, call my manager. So I called the manager. And the manager said, oh, so you would like to play with Wayne <laughs> And I said, well, actually, it's Wayne that wants to play with me. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, you know, sometimes artists have these ambitions that are not realistic. Blah, 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 blah. In the end, this didn't happen. Oh. So I didn't play on the album. But uh, some time passed, and then he called me up and wanted me to join his Change of the Century band, which was the quintet I toured with for uh, nine, ten months about in 1987. And, um, okay, so I came for those rehearsals, and Wayne wasn't there, because he was, I guess, in Japan at the time, so for the first many days, we were rehearsing without him, mm -hmm. and uh, the sound engineer, K2, was sort of leading the rehearsals, and um, that's where I started getting all these keyboard parts, because uh, Jim Beard, who was the keyboard player... He had a lot of work with Jordan's yes. music. So could I, couldn't I help him out since I was playing on this sample keyboard anyway? So I had these parts and I could play some of my sample bottles to play this flute on Mahogany Bird, bird yeah. with Wayne, which I was so proud of being allowed to play this beautiful. Yeah. And I, I loved the music, but um, somehow I felt that, that, you know, I'm into this thing with chemistry and vibrations in the bands. And I didn't feel very comfortable, actually, in, in that band. Somehow it wasn't like we were really finding each other, feeling good playing together. Hmm. Um, I had met, like, Terry Lynn Carrington, who was the drummer in the band, and I had met her in Copenhagen and thought she was a wonderful drummer and had all these ideas about, oh, maybe women like flying on the drums because she was flying on the drums. Yeah. But when we were playing together, somehow I, it, I had the impression it was a time in her life where... Now she was really getting to play some big time thing, and she was very solid and very rock like, a very, very, um, very, um, I don't know how to put it, but very, um, uh, yeah, rock like or very uh, solid. It wasn't mm. like, it was very solid. It wasn't like we could really communicate or play together. We could play together, we, we could lock in, into the time and the grooves, of course. But we were, we were just very different. Mm. I think we had a hard time finding each other, but we toured for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Tried to do it, but I never felt comfortable. And when I look back, I'm just thinking, well, maybe I just didn't really fit in, in that group. Mm -hmm. 
and the feeling that out of respect, because I loved his music, Wayne's music, and wanted to do my best. I always want to do my best, and I'm always into the music when I'm doing it. So maybe I don't realize it when I'm playing it, but realize later mm. that what I'm talking about now, that mm. maybe, maybe it wasn't that that great. Of course, we might have played some good concerts. I have heard a couple of recordings that were really good. I've also heard somewhere this electronic percussion was totally out of proportion. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Controlling which volume do you play it so it sounds natural, mm. which wasn't that easy at that time, neither for me probably or for the people recording it. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, th I thought that was a difficult year, actually. And after the tour, after those 10 months, it was it was over, and Miles called me back. Mm -hmm. Please join my next band. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. Actually, at that time, I ha had thought I was going on tour with Andreas Fallenweider, who I had visited and and played a little bit with. So I was actually getting ready to go on tour with him when Miles called back. And you I can't turn him no. down, yeah? No, I, I just couldn't. So I yeah. took another year. Miles before deciding, okay, three years of this, time for something different. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious um, if there's any pieces of advice that Wayne gave to you that uh, you still found useful or still find useful today. Hmm. Um, you know, with, with Wayne, we actually toured together all the time in a Nightliner bus. So we were together quite a lot. And um, he was very much into the, the Nishiren Shoshu Buddhism, which I had a little peek into in the beginning and uh, decided wasn't quite, uh, I'm sort of, I have my homemade way of being religious or being, being uh, into the spiritual. way the world is, is built, being spiritual, thank you. Um, so I, I didn't continue with being serious with with that um i mainly did that i think to try to find my way into the band and into feeling that we met mm. uh, um, but apart from that i'm not sure that we actually i i can't bring out talks we had in that way uh that I brought with me, ex except maybe that I should trust in my gut feelings. And uh, yeah, I mean, my main lesson from, from these long tours is really be present, be mm. focused in the music, which I think I always am anyway. But of course, when you meet music where you don't feel quite at home, it's of course uh, a challenge to find your space in the music But then music is about finding, mm. finding the magic, finding the strength in the music. So I just continue doing that. Yeah, and, and uh, gravitating towards the things that you, that you can connect with personally. Yeah. That might only be a little thing, but that can become a big thing in, within the music for you. Yeah. It's funny, whenever I... It's it's um, interesting to get your perspective on these things, but because I collect bootlegs of of Wayne and Miles, and you know these are my heroes, so I've heard you a lot with with them, and uh, especially with Wayne. And yesterday, yesterday I saw the whole gig from Lugano again, um, with you know a beautiful little uh, piano duet of you and uh, Jim Beer together who's one of my biggest heroes. So you're playing kind of a free improvised keyboard solo really? with him. Yeah. I don't even remember. So you liked it? I totally liked it. And also you sounded <gasps> very much at, at ease and uh, enjoying yourself and enjoying. It, it seemed like you were, I, I really dug the, the vibe you, you guys had. Uh, <sighs> maybe I was projecting or um, I don't know, but it's interesting to get your perspective on it and, uh, Because you never know what, what goes through the mind of the artist that you're checking out, that you're seeing, you know. Yeah. No, I know that you are very much into Wayne, and I, so am I. I love his music. Um, and, of course, there are great nights 
and less great noise. Of course, yeah. Um, I don't think there's a lot going through my mind actually when I'm playing music because music is great when there's not a lot going on that you're just into the music. And I think I'm always very much into the music when I'm playing. And sometimes afterwards you might have things yeah. coming that you were frustrated or you were happy or whatever it might be. And of course it's all been there. Yeah. But I definitely felt like that group wasn't one with the greatest chemistry where we loved each other <laughs> as much as I need to feel when, when I'm playing music. Sure. Yeah, I understand. I think it might also have been a time in Wayne's life where he had a hard time. Mm. That's my impression, but I'm not going into details because I don't know. Yeah. Of course, we talked together, but I also remember some experiences where maybe maybe he had a little to drink and he would explain some things to me where I didn't understand what he meant and somehow was confused by it and had a hard time playing the next concert because I wonder what he meant. Yeah. And things out, trying to grasp what it what it meant. Um, it might still have been a good thing, mm. but at the time I got confused. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. He could have some uh, some some funny ways of uh, expressing himself. Yeah, of course, I heard him do interviews also where he has his space things. And another experience I had, I've heard his group with Brian Blade and the others. Um, several times when he played in Copenhagen mm. and I loved it. And I thought now he found some playmates mm -hmm. that are releasing his free spirits and the way of playing, which I didn't feel we did at that time. I, I felt it got into this, uh, yeah, this, this uh, little too a uh, set way of playing where we weren't, Uh, exchanging and playing that's, together, which they're doing all the time in in his new group. Yeah, but that's something that I can. Exactly that I, what I. Missed. Yeah, but <laughs> so that's well, something that I could could see uh, you doing in his band. You know, whenever there's a kind of a fixed or locked group, I could see yeah. you escaping, trying to escape. Yeah, trying like, to. Yeah, play with me. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that, that I could see. Yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Always trying to, you know, communicate through the music. I'm not very good at staying in one spe specific place. I mm. have to practice that sometimes, you know. In this tune, it would be good if I'm not reacting so much. Mm -hmm. Be just playing the groove or doing a, a set role, which, of course, I can do, but <laughs> it's yeah. not natural. For me, it's natural to be reacting all the time. Yes. And that's, I think, also why people like when I'm a percussionist, maybe more than hiring me as a drummer, at least in context where they wanted to be more set rules yeah and I'm, i'm very communicating and playful and i like like doing that yeah so but it's also i mean that's also that's also a skill that uh, other people are trying to get towards to i mean um to hear without um how do you say this how can you hear these type of rhythms and ideas and allow them where others see only a fixed kind of groove or a grid or whatever uh, there's so many moments musical moments where they think on records where i hear you okay here's the groove but then whoosh, you go somewhere completely different <laughs> um so allowing that kind of uh energy i think you've said it before you that's something that is in you right from the start was in you right from the start but other people have to get towards this kind of freedom work on that that they can hear these type of rhythms um escaping out of the grid you know what i mean yeah but you as a piano player of course think of that's where i started so when i heard music when i was young i didn't hear it from a drummer perspective yeah. at all i didn't start doing that before long past i started playing drums myself actually because i hear it more as a composer i think or maybe as a piano player with How could you add the colors? Yeah. So, so yes, for me, it was the opposite. I had to learn to, well, a drummer is someone that knows where their groove is set. Yeah. Stay there. You can be solid. You can yeah. be the center. You know, That's mm. something I had to learn, yeah. where most drummers do it the other way. 
Can you describe the differences between... Oh, now we've talked about playing with Terry Lynn, but how was it for you to then to play with uh, somebody like Ricky Wellman? Because I feel really felt... To me, it really feels locked in what you guys did. And you, you, you know, he's very strong in the, in the groove and in the beat. But what you do is... What you already described is the, the coloring part around it flourishes and, and ideas... It really felt like a really great match to me. Yeah. I mean, in the first Miles year, we were playing with Miles' nephew, Vince Wil Wilburn. Right. Which... Also on Aura, right? He, he's also on Aura. Well, he's also a guest on Aura, but then there's also another drummer on Aura. So so there's a Danish yeah. drummer, oh, actually. Yeah, right. which, so that gives a little more jazzy feeling to, to some of it. Uh, Vince is playing electronic drums only, D drums or whatever yeah. they were called. Simmons, I think they were called at the time. Um, so the move to Ricky Wellman was a, a big step, uh, getting into some more nuanced kind of, of grooves, because uh, he had some really hip grooves, Ricky. Yeah. Uh, but but that was still kind of uh, difficult for me. Because uh, simply because I just came from another kind of, of musical atmosphere, playing more, I mean, free jazz, homemade stuff, odd times, um, as I said, more kind of reacting, whatever. Um, so learning to be to be solid and be, be into the groove was something I was focused on doing but wasn't necessarily my, my thing. But of course, I'm very much into just listening where is the music. So I would I would uh, lock in with Ricky. Uh, when I was playing solos, I remember we would sometimes drift apart because I would get into my weird triplet things and he wouldn't always know what I meant. Mm. So sometimes I had the feeling, okay, we're drifting, I better grab him. <laughs> um, wasn't always easy either. Of course, we could groove together, but I remember this thing of soloing wasn't always as easy as I found with, with others. Mm. I would say the, the Norwegian guy out in Clive that I have in Future Song, he's played all the Future Song gigs in all the, we started in 89, right? So that's a long time. We're always totally together. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so an example of someone where it's really, wow, the chemistry was there from the first moment. Mm. So that's the exciting part of music is meeting all these different musicians and where where do we meet? Where do we bond? What what do we have in common? Where where can we talk and inspire each other? Mm. So yeah. Um, one more thing about Miles. There's these uh, moments in uh, I think '88 where uh, Miles couldn't make some of the gigs and people stepped in subbing for him and there's this beautiful and obscure uh, recording of Herbie subbing for Miles with a trumpet sound. For most of the gig he's playing that trumpet sound. How was that for you? I mean, how was that? Do you have any memories from that gig? Yeah, I sure do. Actually, the story was I had left the band by then and Miles had these two gigs in Italy that he couldn't make. And then they called me up and, and said, couldn't you come and join the band so we will be a little more Miles Davis band? <laughs> and the first day, Chick Corea was Miles. What and did she do? Day, Herbie. <laughs> Chick Corea did not sample the Harmon mute okay. <laughs> and, and pretend to be, uh, to be Miles. He was more just uh, playing Chick and out with his keyboard and, and stuff and... Uh, well, I know Chick a little bit. He actually did a course in Denmark in 1972, my first jazz course I took in Denmark. Uh, and I was on Chick Corea's group, oh, uh, nice. theory okay. group, learning about Scientology, which I didn't know what was at the time. Oh, okay. But it was very exciting for me to hear about the uh, metaphysics of music, actually. Mm -hmm. Very inspired by that. Well, that's a side story. Um the gig with Chick Corea wasn't nearly as much fun, actually, as Herbie, because Herbie's much more communicating with the band. Okay. To relate to what I was talking about, yeah. Herbie is someone that does play with whoever he's with. 
uh, where Chick was more soloists. It was really exciting, actually, to do those two gigs. It was a lot yeah. of fun uh, because the band, which, which was the same that I had just left, uh, they like went crazy because they didn't have this strong leader making them know their places. So they were all like going crazy a yeah. bit in, in those concerts, and, yeah, playing much more wild, which I thought was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And, and the gig with Herbie was was really inspiring, actually. Apart from that, maybe I'm not sure I liked that he was playing with the mild sound. That was maybe for me a little. Ah, I'm not sure I, I thought that was so tasteful, but but he was good at it. <laughs> yeah, and he I think he could channel his inner miles, uh, you know, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. You know, there were some really pretty One, distinctive miles moments. Yeah, yeah, he can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, but uh, yeah, because I've I've seen that bootleg a couple of times and you know uh, listened to it. I'm wondering, what was Herbie like rehearsing that music? Sorry, I'm always keeping back going uh, back to rehearsals, but I don't think we rehearsed at all for those gigs. I don't remember anything oh, about. Okay. Maybe I don't remember. I think I just showed up with my all my kilos of percussion, and <laughs> you know I traveled around with 300 kilos at that time. Wow. Those were the days. Now it's like, I wonder what they'll bring for me. <laughs> ah, I see, I see. <laughs> so it was all your personal stuff that you brought wherever you wherever you went. Yeah. Mm. What was the the chase for you for new sounds? What was it like? Uh, the the chase for you know I need this new gong or whatever. It seems like you you are inviting all these type of type of colors into your uh, palette. Yeah, I'm, and I'm I wondering where that started. It well, I could tell that story. I'm not sure I need all those things or thought I needed them even. But when I started playing drums at first, which I started because my piano teacher had said, you need a real education. At that time, of course, I knew that I was into my own music and into playing improvised music of different sorts. And they only had a classical conservatory in Denmark. And that's where I had to study. And I'm like, I'm not going to go study classical piano. I'm not going to be a classical piano. I have to think of something different. And I had already made my first band. Of course, I was playing Fender Rhodes and pedals and singing a bit, composing and all that in my first band, Sirens, it was called. Mm. And um, I noticed there was no, actually, when I started the band with, with two female musicians that I had met at this jazz course. And uh, then so I had, first I had Alex Riel, the drummer, Danish, very good drummer in the band. And he left and I had some other uh, male musicians. And I noticed, of course, there's no female drummers around. Maybe that needs to be researched. I wonder how it will sound. I'm into dancing. I mean, I wonder, maybe that would be a very physical thing for me to do in between the piano and the dancing. I think I'm going to try that. So I bought my first drum set and uh, went to the conservatory where they had this new line where you could have your main instrument. You could choose your main instrument if you had something you were good at. And I was a very good piano player. So I played piano for the admission test, mm. got in and had classical percussion as my main instrument there and got totally into that and decided, yeah, This is my thing. So um, that's how I started getting it. Then I just started playing drums in all, with all the musicians I had played piano with. And yeah, it probably sounded awful when I started playing. I wasn't at all self-conscious, so I just did it and learned it through doing it. And for some reason, the musicians accepted that and, and liked doing it. And I had some different uh, jam sessions with people and had a good one once where we were playing in a big group and the guitar player said, yeah, this was really hip. I want to make a band out of this. And then he made a band out of it and asked this drummer, Alex Riel, to be the drummer and asked a piano player called Johan Embo to be the piano player and said, but I was in this jam session. I <laughs> want to be in the band. I could, I could uh, play percussion, <laughs> which I wasn't really into at the time. I was into playing drums. And, uh, okay, so I became a member. I played a lot of marimba at the time. 
So I would compose all the music for the band playing marimba, mm. singing. We sang like a partido alto, this area to Moreira tune, and I would be Flora in the band, yeah. <laughs> Latin improvisations and stuff. And I wrote a lot of music for the band. And Alex, he was sponsored by Paiste. Mm. So he would say, here, I have all these gongs in my garage. You can play those. And here's some this and that. And he would like bring all the stuff he had dusty in his garage and say, here, you can play all this. So that's how I got into all the stuff with playing gongs and mm. all that. It started there. And then he said, is there anything else you want from Pais? <laughs> uh, so they had all these tuned gongs and yeah, I'd like those and those and those. Oh, nice. And I got this collection. And then we, when we were touring with that band, Six Winds, I had like three gigantic sections of gongs. And I had my marimba. And I had, the, in those days, gigantic PA system with the speakers and the mixer and the amp and the microphones and the stands. And I was schlepping around all that stuff. And when the concerts were over <laughs> and the others were having a party <laughs> and I was packing all this stuff, that was wondering, why am I always so angry when the concerts were <laughs> <laughs> I had so much stuff at those times. Um, but that's how it started. So right. it wasn't like a need. It was just, yeah, I could have all these things. And it started and then I got into it. So when I stumbled upon instruments when I was traveling around the world, for example, Oh, now I'm in China. I have to check out the Chinese gongs and the Chinese bells. And it's more like that, that, you know, I would like, I would be curious. And what what do they have in the countries I'm traveling to? Yeah. I would go to like Greece and they would say, oh, when you're in this village, you have to check out the sheep bells. And then I would go there and they would have all these sh sheep bells and I can't fit the big ones in my suitcase, so I'll get a lot of the small ones. Now I have like 11 sheep bells that I play. You've probably heard them on some recordings for these. <laughs> yes. So it's it's like, it's just, um, it just um, came to me and it ended up like this. And now I have this gigantic collection. Or amazing. Museum. And I love collecting sounds. And I, mm. normally I say it's because I used to play the piano and it had so many different notes. So now I just have all these different sounds that I mm -hmm. love playing on. Yeah, and you use them not only in a percussive, but also in a melodic way, I feel. Like that. I, unfortunately, I don't play that much marimba anymore, but uh, I do it sometimes still. Mm -hmm. But it's one, it's one thing of having all those sounds. Another thing is to hear them and to be able to identify where you get one sound. So how did you get acquainted with each sound and then found a, a place for it in the in the set that also is something that happens gradually like in the beginning with my bell collection i had this kind of magic thing with i'm not supposed to know what their pitches are so it's just magic on a good day yes <laughs> there and on a bad day oh that's the wrong note <laughs> mm. But by now I've had them so many years, so most of the good ones I do know the pitches, and I might use them. I know that these ones fit in that too. Um, but it, it's something gradual, and it's it's very much an intuitive thing to just follow the emotion and be moving around with these sounds, and all these uh, singing sounds, the klang <laughs> sounds, as you can say in German or in Danish. Mm. Um, so I call it klangperk. Uh, these sounds go very much with the lyrical and poetic kinds of music very much. So they found their space in the in this kind of music, basically, where then there's the drums for the more groovy music. And so like when you have the sounds, they gradually find their own spaces. Like the clay drums, they fit very well when there's not a bass in the music or when it's kind of ritual and not too loud and... So all the instruments have their identities and their languages and find their spaces. And that's mm. what being a percussion player is about, basically. At least my kind of multi-percussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you maybe talk about come of, a couple of your uh, influences in, in terms of 
what kind of percussionists were role models for you that you followed that you that you checked out studied now i've talked a little bit about my my younger days um because i grew up in the time where like where the women are we can do it all we we can find our own ways of, of doing things so I, my feeling is that I never had role models and I've never like wanted to be like someone else. But of course, music is, is like that. You listen to all these people and they inspire you and become a part of your musical consciousness, which is a beautiful thing. Um, so music, we all own the music. We all own the sounds and we use them in our individual ways. That's the way I think of it. Um, so people like Nana Vasconcelos, I played a lot with Janka Bark, for example, uh, has, of course, meant something to me. He was mm. the first one I heard playing on the udu, the clay drum. Um, and when I heard that instrument, I really was attracted to it and wanted to have one. So the first time when Miles invited me to New York, I went to the music shop and found an udu. <laughs> yeah. um, My parents had one. I remember playing it as yeah. on, on yeah. the yeah. sound. Um, of course, Ayatou Moreira, I've, I've listened to and, and admired. But uh, as I might have said already, I think I think a lot as a, as a composer and think a lot in sounds and melodies in general, more than in how the drummer is playing or how the percussionist is playing. Mm. So um, the, the people that really inspired me when, when I was into finding my path as a young person are like Miles Davis, Beaches Brew, specifically that album. Uh, George Russell with his Living Time. Where, you know that album with no. Bill Evans? Oh, wait. Uh, with Bill Evans, I've heard that before. Living Time, it's called? Living Time, it's called. And Bill Evans is the soloist. And that way of like composing for a big band where they're in groupings, and it's like a cacophony of these groups that sit in and out in their own timing. And that's really a great way of thinking big groups of musicians, I think. So that's really been an inspiration for me. Mm. And Lissaka by Stravinsky is one of my very earliest inspirations that followed me so much in my music that I sometimes when I'm playing, ah, that comes from there. Yeah. I Nice. Now it goes back to when I was seven year old, uh, seven years old, and was always listening to this piece. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, so it's more like that kind of inspirations than it's specifically percussion players or drummers. Of course, there are drummers that I that I love, but I've I've never really studied them or know how do they do it. I've never taken drum lessons. I had two drum lessons with Ed Thigpen an American drummer that lived in, in yeah. Copenhagen. But from that, I've only learned classical percussion and tried to figure out. And Alex, who I played with, of course, is a great inspiration for me because mm -hmm. he probably had a big part in that I started playing drums because it looked like so much fun. He was always smiling and having yeah. fun. He's another guy that always is reacting when he plays to whatever's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely an inspiration, but I never learned it directly. I never took a lesson or learned parad paradiddles or something from him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he has played on so many records. I mean, he has, he has played with them all at the uh, Jazz Who's, yeah. you know, and, or, yeah, was it Cafe? Last September. Say again? He, he just turned 80 years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. Maybe I should talk to him. Yeah, he still plays. Yeah. Incredible guy. I think I have recordings with him and, and Dexter and, and Ben Webster and uh, Bill Evans and, you know, all of these. Wow. But my favorite group when I was a teenager was, it was called Riel Mikkelborg V8. It was Pelle Mikkelborg, Alex Riel. And I was, from I was 14, 15 years old, I would go to their concerts and I would be dancing totally wild all over the place. So the first time I, when I called Alex to join my, my, my woman's band when I was uh, 17, mm -hmm. um, 
I have this little trail. <laughs> and he said, yes. And I'm like, why did he say yes? But he actually knew who I was because I was the one that was always dancing and knew the tune so much by heart that I would be totally in sync with the, with the music wow. when I was dancing. So I think he spotted that. Well, why else would he say I knew nothing about playing with people when I started playing with him? Mm. I'd never, you know, really played with people. Still, as a piano. That's nice, but I, yeah. I I can understand that. I mean, we, we somehow we notice when somebody's paying attention to our music. We we notice, right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Are you can always... <laughs> say again. Sorry. If we're not too absorbed right. in the music, <laughs> yeah, but you can almost see it in in the eyes of the audience or the the way somebody's listening to you, how much they listen. You know, sometimes very noticeable. Yeah. Marilyn, sometimes I mean, always when I hear you, I I hear landscapes. Yeah, uh, I can't really describe it. It's more like. I hear landscape, I, I see things, but also on a technical aspect, I, I, I thought about it. You know, you, you brought so many different sounds into your palette that you create a scenery or a three-dimensional thing whenever you introduce new sounds that creates a, a distance between sounds and a, and, a, and a room sometimes because some sounds might have more sustain, whatever, you know. Do you think of of landscapes or stuff like that when you play? Um, maybe I think more of movements, actually. Because I notice that when I'm listening to music and I'm trying to describe it, I'll turn it into a movement. <laughs> Probably because of being Dancing. an old dancer. Um, of course, when I'm composing, I'm often thinking in, in landscapes or seasons or... You know, I live close to, what, well, right outside my window in the other house is, is a big lake, a small lake, sorry. And that's very inspiring. It gives me this moodiness, and it's often a part of when I compose. Um, but when I'm playing, it's hard to say, because, you know, as I said, when I'm really into the music, I'm not thinking I wouldn't. It's hard to say if it's a landscape or it's a movement or, mm. or what is it. It's, It's a feeling, it's a vibration. That's the thing with music. It's so hard to translate into words because it's that's why we play music to avoid making it little or making right. Into words. Mm -hmm. 